So what we're going to be focusing on tonight is uh, reading comprehension. We'll be talking about uh, how to read for the LSAT specifically. Um, reading for the LSAT is a little bit different from the types of reading that we might do uh, otherwise in, uh, in other walks of life, uh, either academically or for fun or for work. Um, so we're going to talk specifically about how to improve your ability to read for the LSAT. Um, we're going to be review, we'll talk about reviewing, how to review effectively to get the most out of any work that you do. Um, and then specifically the questions and how to master reading comprehension questions. So we are going to be using a passage from the June 2007 test. If you have a copy of that handy, if you have a printed copy and you want to uh, read off your printed copy, sometimes with reading comprehension, that's nice to do. Um, some people find it a little bit easier to read off a printed page than, than reading the passage on the screen, but we will have the passage and the questions on the screen for you. Um, all right. So let's dive in. We, um, and actually, before we get started, I'd like to get a little bit of a, uh, just a poll um, in the chat window. And uh, I have everything set up right now. So right now, I'm the only one who will see your answers. Um, the, uh, and again, if you go to the bottom of the screen and you click on chat, um, and just let me know in the chat window, give me a couple, a couple words about your, your, where you are with LSAT prep. Are you totally new to the LSAT? Have you been studying for a few months? Have you uh, taken an actual LSAT yet? Um, just like to know a little bit about where everyone is tonight and where you are currently in your LSAT prep. So just go ahead and click on chat down there at the bottom of the screen. Okay, so hopefully what we're going to cover tonight will, will, okay, looks like we have some people who are totally new. That's totally fine. Hopefully whatever we talk about tonight will, will, uh, will help you out, you know, regardless of where you are in your prep. Um, if you have been studying for a while on your own, you've been prepping on your own, hopefully this will complement whatever you've been doing. Um, if you've been taking a class with us or working with some of our resources, this should dovetail nicely with that. And if you are totally new to this, then hopefully we'll get you started in a good direction um, in, in when you start working on the, the reading comprehension section. So um, what I'm going to do is show you part of a passage. I'm going to show you the first paragraph of an LSAT reading comprehension passage. And so you'll just be reading this first paragraph. I'm going to give you about I don't know, 20 seconds or so to read this first paragraph. So we'll be going through this passage, you know, step by step. Um, so here it is. Take about 20 seconds and read this first paragraph. When you're ready, tell me in the chat window, what do you think is important in this paragraph? Like, what's this paragraph all about? What's the main idea? What's the most important thing you see here? If you want, just in the chat window, um, just give me like maybe one or two words or one or two, or maybe a, a couple of line numbers. Um, you can see the line numbers over here on the side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, give me one or two line numbers that if you see any specific lines that you think are particularly important in here. Let's see what people think. So, uh, okay. So good. 
Tom saying scholars rely on historical documents and historical documents are scarce. Yeah, so when you first start reading one of these passages, you do want to make sure that you have some idea of the topic, some idea of, of what it's about, right? Um, I don't know if you've ever, if this has ever happened to you, um, but if you've ever like gotten halfway through reading comprehension passage or even to the end and realized you just like had no idea what it was about. Like I have no idea what I just read. Um, that's happened to me, to me <laughs> once or twice. Um, often late at night when I've been, you know, working for a while and, and was working on one of the last RC passages of the day that I was going to work on. But uh, so when you read the first couple of lines, we want to make sure this is about, you know, we, we understand this is about the changing face of the Irish landscape. Uh, and scholars traditionally relied on primary evidence from historical documents. Okay, so Irish landscape, historical documents, you know, general idea of what it's about. Um, and then as Tom noted out, these documents are... It, I'm not sure if it says the documents are scarce, but it certainly says the sources provide a fragmentary record at best. So that could mean the documents are scarce, could definitely mean that. Um, it could also just mean there are lots of documents, but they just don't provide a lot of information. I mean, maybe they all say the same thing and it doesn't really give us a lot of information. Um, so it says reliable accounts are very scarce for many parts of Ireland prior to the 17th century. Okay, so it sounds like maybe, you know, further back than this, we're not really seeing much. Um, many relevant documents focus selectively. So they're saying selectively, focusing on selective matters, selective things. All right. So this seems like a pretty, you know, typical introductory paragraph, introducing, in, introducing us to this um, topic that the, the passage is going to be about. Um, if I had to focus in on one specific, one or two specific lines. So, and, and what I would say is if you saw me like, make any, if I was actually working on this passage, you were watching me work on this passage and you were looking at the notes I made, I would probably put a little bracket around these few lines. Um, because that to me is like the main point of that paragraph, that the documentary sources provide a fragmentary record at best. And the reason I say that is because this is kind of uh, introducing the idea, introducing us to these historical documents, the first sentence. And then these last couple sentences seem to be explaining why, you know, giving us a little more detail about why that's the case. And this is one of the, uh, when you're reading, probably one of the most valuable things you can do in reading comprehension on the LSAT is if you can see uh, a, a couple of lines, uh, one, of our, one of my colleagues, uh, Patrick Terrell, one of our LSAT instructors, talks about the MVP, the most valuable piece or the most valuable phrase in this paragraph. If you can see a few lines that encapsulate what that paragraph is about, then um, it does a couple things for you. We're going to create what's called a passage map, which is basically just a catalog, a mental index of the main point of each paragraph. And if you're identifying the main point of each paragraph and you're identifying how the paragraphs are related to one another, um, then that's going to give you a large amount of the information that you're going to need to answer questions correctly, or at least get you off to a good start. So one of the more important things to remember about reading for the LSAT, again, I, I said a little, a little bit ago, when you read RC passages for the LSAT, it's a different type of reading maybe than we're used to doing or than we've, you know, kind of been programmed ourselves to do um, in, in other academic walks of life. Um, they're going to give you a lot of details. They're going to give you a lot of details in these passages, but not all the details are important. And what I mean by that is, you know, they, they, you, they could ask you questions about anything, but in terms of what you have to remember, if you're remembering the main points, the main points of each paragraph, and you have an understanding of how the different paragraphs relate to one another, that's going to be the main thing to focus on that's going to help you when you answer questions. Other details may be important. They may ask you about them. But if you, if you focus on these points, the main ideas, then you'll have a good idea of where to look if you have to go back and, you know, understand a specific detail. Um, but a lot of the questions, as you're going to see, as we're going to see in a moment, are you'll be able to answer just based on this big picture understanding. So um, this is what I would, you know, probably look at as being important in this passage. Just these few out of this whole paragraph so far, out of this whole paragraph, it's really just these few statements, you know, so, and I'm, I'm a little bit lazy and I think it's okay to be a little lazy when you're working on the LSAT. Like I could actually underline these few phrases and that would give me an idea of what the of what the first paragraph is about but if i can just put a little bracket around a couple of uh of, of, of 
lines and that, you know, I can go back and quickly scan those and read those and get the information, read those lines and get the information I need. So we're talking about the changing face of the Irish landscape, the changing Irish landscape, how there's evidence about it from historical documents, but these evidence provide a fragmentary record at best, whatever that is. All right. So, and one of the main takeaways or one of the things I'm going to try to impress upon you tonight is that you want to develop your reading strategy, a personal reading strategy that works for you. And it's going to be different for everybody. So the honest truth about the LSAT reading comprehension is that if you, if you can read and understand what you're reading and remember a lot of details, that is going to help you answer questions. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it won't. Um, but you also can and should and need to have a plan and a strategy for the situations where that doesn't happen. And if that's a lot of the time for you on the LSAT, I mean, it's a lot of people are that way. You know, there are a lot of people who prep for this test and do fairly well on this test who feel like in reading comprehension, a large number of the passages just don't, you know, make a whole lot of sense to them um, at, at first glance, right, at first. Uh, other people, you know, don't have much trouble reading at all. They read, they understand, and, you know, they're focusing more on the questions. So you're going to develop your own reading strategy based on your level of understanding. And you want to evaluate and be honest about your level of understanding when you're reading these passages. So uh, one of the things we talk about, and if you've taken a course with us or if you looked at some of our, our materials, um, we talk about this thing called PAIR, which means pause, evaluate, evaluate, anticipate, and repeat. Sometimes the R is for reassess, but we'll just call it repeat. And so this is a process you're gonna follow every time you're reading a passage. At the end of each paragraph, you wanna pause and evaluate what you just read. If it's a really long paragraph, then pause in the middle of the paragraph, right? Evaluate what you just read. Take a few moments to think about, you know, what you understand from this passage that you read. What was important to you? What do you think is important about this paragraph that you just read? What's the main idea, the main point? What are the things that you need to notice? Um, and if you, if you feel like you have a really good understanding of the paragraph that you're reading, then when you, when you do this pause and you evaluate what you just read, you know, you are kind of focusing on the bigger picture. Like, what is the main point? If you can just glance back quickly at the paragraph and say, okay, that, those couple lines there in the middle, those, those, that's, that's the main point. It's the main idea of this whole paragraph, the main point of this paragraph. If you see any opinions, especially the author's opinion, and I would say that what we just looked at what we just identified, I, I would call that an author's opinion. Um, such documentary resources provide a fragmentary record at best. I mean, that may be a pretty verifiable opinion, but, you know, it, it, it may not be like, you know, it's not like the author saying, the person writing this, this paragraph is saying, you know, and these historical documents are absolutely awful and they should be burned, right? We're not going, it's not any kind of extreme opinion or, or, or really a subjective opinion. But, this, you know, this seems to be the thing that this author is trying to convince us of so far. He's introduced this idea, and then just the fact that the author seems to be providing some support for that. This seems to be the main thing that the author of the passage, whoever's writing this, wants us to take away from this whole paragraph. Everything else is designed to, to you know, support that idea. So if you just, if you can read this paragraph quickly and just notice that, then, then fantastic. If you notice that that was the main idea, it's an opinion, you said, hey, that sounds like the author's opinion, then great. If you don't, though, if you're, if you're, you know, reading a paragraph, a passage, and you're feeling lost, then you can slow down and you can use this pair process on individual sentences, right? So, and this is something I think that test takers are reluctant to do. And what I'm going to say is, even if this particular passage that we're looking at right now or this particular paragraph is not difficult for you, you want to think about this because sooner or later, just about everyone will run into a passage that is difficult for them. Just about everyone sooner or later is going to run into, it could be an entire passage. It could be just a single paragraph within a passage. So everything I'm talking here, everything I'm talking about here it may apply to you, maybe not all the time, but if you have, you want to have a backup plan, right? What happens if I don't really get what I'm reading? What happens if it doesn't really clearly make sense to me? What are you going to do? Just give up on that passage? I mean, we don't want to do that, right? We still want to get the points. So one thing you can do, one thing that, that people are reluctant to do, I think, is slow down a little bit. I think people are really reluctant to slow down when they need to. The LSAT is, it's a time test, right? And you do have to work quickly and efficiently to answer as many questions as possible. But that doesn't mean that you read quickly all the time. 
So you need to know when it's time to slow down, when you're understanding things and things are working really well for you and you can just, you know, ro keep rolling or when you need to slow down and take things more step by step. So if you need to read each of these, you know, read each sentence and pause for a second and say, well, you know, what is, what am I, you know, what is this sentence telling me? What do I need to understand here? Um, and then read the next sentence and think about how that next sentence is related to what you just read. In fact, this is, um, in, there's a lot of overlap between reading comprehension and logical reasoning. And when these little paragraphs that you read in the logical reasoning section, the way that you read them very often can be the same as the way you would read an individual paragraph in a reading comprehension passage. And I would say if you're practicing some of the same techniques in reading comprehension that you're using in logical reasoning, that can go a long way. You're getting more, you're getting more mileage for your money, right? You're getting more bang for your buck. So for example, these, in, it, let's, let's think about logical reasoning for a second. If you've looked at the logical reasoning section, very often a logical reasoning, um, the little paragraph they give you in logical reasoning will start out with some opposing point, right? It's gonna start out with some point that the argument that they're giving you is eventually gonna refute. And then very often you're gonna get this pivot word, right? A word like however, and that's pivoting from the opponent, from the opposing point to the main point or the author of the, the argument's point, right? And so in this case, that's what we get. We get the main point of this paragraph after that, however, after that pivot, or we could call this the conclusion, the author's conclusion. And then after that, we get some support, evidence, premises. These last couple sentences seem to be supporting that main point, that conclusion right after the however. Um, and this is, again, a very common pattern that you're going to see in logical reasoning as well. So if you need to slow down a little bit to notice that pattern, to notice that that however is there, and to notice that this is really, you know, a, 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 the main point, the conclusion in this paragraph, and that the remaining sentences are support for that. If you need to slow down a little bit and take it step by step to understand that, do that. That's what you should be doing right now when you're working on reading comprehension passages. It doesn't mean that it's, that's what you're going to be doing on test day right? Because with practice, you can and will and should be getting faster. But sometimes you need to be willing to slow down and focus on doing things correctly, rather than just always trying to go as fast as you can and then not seeing and identifying these, these features and these points that are going to help you actually when you go and answer questions. So you want to make sure that you are reading and seeing the features of each paragraph that you should to understand, you know, what, 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 what's this paragraph doing? What is it trying to, what is it, what are they trying to tell me? Is the author trying to convince me of something here? What's going on? So um, I want everybody thinking about this. I want everybody thinking as you read each paragraph here, be honest with yourself about um, how well you understand what you're reading. If it's all going smoothly, yeah, this, you know, this isn't hard. This, this makes total sense. Then, you know, at the end of each paragraph, pause, reflect on the main point, look for any opinions, especially author's opinion. And then if you are feeling confused though, be willing to slow down and evaluate each sentence individually as you read it. Take a quick pause after each sentence. Think about it. Don't try to, you know, jam it all in your head and absorb it all at once. All right. So let's look at the next paragraph in this passage. And then, you know, again, think about reading this in a way that works for you, for where you are right now and for your understanding of what you're reading. And when you're ready, I would like you to, in the chat window, and again, if you've just logged in, if you, uh, you should see something around the bottom of your screen that says chat, and or if not, uh, and you might need to hover your, your mouse over the bottom of your screen to see that. If not, maybe you see a button that says more, and then if you click on more, you can see the chat button open the chat window. But I'd like you to uh, type in the chat window a couple of one or more, again, these are the line numbers over here on the left side. Give me one or more line numbers of the lines that you think are the, the main idea, the main point of this paragraph. What's the main point here? Why, what's, what's this paragraph trying to convince us of? What is this paragraph trying to sell us?
So one thing to notice is in the last paragraph, we were talking about a problem, right? There's a problem with these historical documents. And now we're talking about studies of fossilized, grain, fossilized pollen grains provide an additional means of investigating landscape change. Now, maybe there's, you know, like, and some people, maybe right now you're looking at this and going, oh, it's a science passage. I hate science passages. So you got to realize the LSAT isn't a science test. You're not being tested on your understanding of scientific knowledge. You're being tested on your ability to read a paragraph like this and whether or not you're familiar with fossilized pollen grains and how they're studied doesn't matter. It's can you pick out pieces of information here that are familiar to you that you do understand and can and should understand and use that to build a picture of what this paragraph is all about. So we're studying something, fossilized pollen grains. I mean, we probably know what pollen is, right? Or at least have some idea, right? If, you're, if you live here in North Carolina, uh, every spring we get like this cloud of pine pollen that shows up, this yellow pine pollen that blows off the trees. So uh, maybe other parts of the country uh, have similar things going on in the spring. But so you get just, you know, you don't even need to know exactly what fossilized pollen grains are, but just some idea what pollen is. Um, an additional means of investigating landscape change. This is what the last paragraph was, was about, right? Some kind of something about landscape changing and how the documents, the historical documents don't help us understand it very well. <clears throat> so now we have a different way of doing it. Okay. So details of the changes in vegetation uh are reflected in the kinds and quantities of minute pollen grains that become trapped in sediments okay so somehow details of changes in vegetation are reflected in the pollen right one of the things that i think happens when people are reading some of these passages is you see a bunch of information that you don't understand or it like doesn't really make a lot of sense to you and what you should be thinking of as you read is actively looking for the things that you do understand. So details of changes. I mean, does that mean something to you? In vegetation, resulting from, are reflected in the pollen grains. Right. So if you get a general idea, if you know, if you again, what I hope is, and I, it's fantastic if you understand every word of this and you're just nodding your head and going, yeah, I mean, I understood that. But again, you need a strategy for, you know, what you're going to do if you're reading something that you don't understand. And, and it's a very natural thing to focus on the parts of this that are confusing. And, and in fact, what we probably have a tendency to do, and the LSAT takes advantage of this. They will, the test writers know this and they take full advantage of it. They know that when you start reading something that's confusing, you're probably likely to try to read it three or four or five times. And maybe like when I, when I started talking a minute ago and I asked you to read the paragraph and then I started talking, maybe you're only like halfway through. Maybe you're still reading the second sentence for like the third or fourth or fifth time. And again, just get as much information as you can out of it. You don't really have the time to read things three or four or five or six times. And especially you don't have the time to read them three or four or five or six times and still not understand them. So try to get the information you can out of it. And if you're really not getting much out of it, then just keep reading. Analysis of samples. Okay, we're analyzing something. Samples can identify which kinds of plants produce the pollen. Okay, so we're analyzing samples of pollen. Uh, and in many ways, the or cases, the findings can serve to supplement or correct the documentary record. Okay, so I think you could make a good argument for the idea that this first sentence is just that this, this first sentence is really what's important here. We're talking about uh, the fossilized pollen grains providing an additional means of investigating landscape change. Those historical documents don't really help us much. They're limited. So now we have another way of studying this. Um, you might notice that they were talking about supplementing or correcting the documentary record. I mean, that could be important too, right? So if you zeroed in on that last, those last couple lines, I mean, that, that's, a, or, or, you know, some combination of both, um, then you probably have a good idea of what the paragraph is about. And again, notice that this last line here kind of circles back to something that's more familiar that we already read about. Supplement or correct the documentary record, that, that document record that we know is not very reliable. So a lot of times if you read 
what, you know, a couple of th different things can happen when you're reading one of these paragraphs is you can end up getting some information right in the first sentence that's helpful and that you do understand pretty well, or at least you have some idea of, of what's going on. And then they can try to bog you down. They try to get you stuck in the mud with all these, 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 you know, details, scientific jargon, language concepts that you might not be familiar with. But if you just keep reading, sometimes they circle back and give you, give you a, a statement or two at the end that are, that, that's fairly clear. So again, I would recommend, you know, rather than getting bogged down in some of the details, just keep reading, keep reading and see if either, you know, one of two things might happen. Either the, the gory details just continue all the way to the end, but then at least, you know, you're going to focus on that first sentence that, that did have some information that you understood. Or sometimes you might find that they actually do give you some, you know, something at the end of the paragraph, a sentence or so, or just a couple lines that are a little more clear and kind of encapsulate what, or, or just, you know, circle back to a concept that you do understand. Um, so, all right, in terms of what's important in this paragraph, um, we're focusing on just this, these foss this pollen, fossilized pollen gives us another ways of investigating this landscape change that we're talking about. All right, so let's look at this next paragraph. Go ahead and read this. Okay. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to ask everybody in the chat window. Um, give me, uh, and just, you can put the line numbers, right? And then, you know, again, we have the line numbers over on the side, line 25, line 30. Just put a couple line numbers in the chat window of the lines of this passage that you think, or the lines in this paragraph that you think are important, and kind of highlight what the whole paragraph is about. Anything in here that, that stood out to you? I'm going to show you one of my favorite phrases on the LSAT. Um, it's this one right here, for example. Because we were just talking about using pollen to investigate landscape changes and, you know, fix this problem with document, historical documents. And then we get this word, for example, in the beginning of the next paragraph. For example is great because if I say, you know, I don't know, um... I don't know, my friend is a great juggler. For example, okay, so I'm telling you, I'm giving you this opinion that my friend is a great juggler. And I say, for example, he can juggle flaming torches. Like, so whatever comes after for the, the phrase, for example, is going to be an example of what came before. So this short phrase, for example, tells you the relationship between what you're about to read and what you just read. So if, what, if you have a pretty clear understanding of what was in the last paragraph, as soon as you see, for example, you should have some idea of what's going on next. If what was in the last paragraph was kind of confusing, then maybe you get another shot at it. Right? Maybe you start reading this. An analysis of samples from the long, low, and county down have revealed significant patterns of cereal grain pollen. Okay, so, you know, okay, so they're finding the cereal grain pollen beginning 400 AD, a long time ago. Um, you know, we're talking about the clay making cultivation by primitive tools difficult. Historians thought. Okay, so this is another thing that can be really useful as you're reading. You're getting, uh, anytime they talk about somebody, anytime they're telling you about somebody and what that person thought or what that person said or their views, um, that can give you a handle on what this whole paragraph is about. So they thought the soils were not tilled to any significant extent extent until the introduction of the moldboard plow. Do I need to know what a moldboard plow is? I'm going to be honest. I actually looked it up before this class. When I was reading this passage to, you know, before this class, I, I want to know what a moldboard board plow is. Do I need to know that when I'm actually, 
working on this passage under time conditions on the LSAT? No, it's a plow. Do you know what a plow is? It's some kind of farm tool. That's all you need to know, right? So again, don't get bogged down in the things that you don't understand. Don't let the things that you do not understand distract you from the, the, the things that you, the, the clues that they're giving you or the information they're giving you that will help you understand. So they thought the soils weren't tilled. So they weren't doing something to the soil uh, until the plows were introduced in the seventh century. So the, the indicate so now so the historians thought something just when they say historians thought probably I would expect in, an, in a reading comprehension passage that they're going to tell me something else. So the pollen evidence, hey, we're using this pollen to understand more about what's going on, indicates that the soils must have been successfully tilled before the introduction of the new plow. Okay, so what sounds like what's going on here is. The pollen evidence shows us that the, the, uh, the historians were not totally correct. They thought that the soil wasn't tilled until the plows came along, but the pollen shows that, yeah, they were actually tilling the soil before the introduction of the plow. And again, the more you understand about this, the better. It's fantastic if you, maybe you grew up on a farm and you understand all this perfectly. Uh, maybe you studied Irish history, maybe you studied, maybe you're a, you know, a biology major and you did wrote a paper on this, right? So if you understand all this really well, that's fantastic. But what I'm trying to show you here is there's still pieces of information here, if you're just looking for it, that will give you some idea, not a perfect idea, but some idea what this paragraph is about. And you don't have to read it three or four times to, to get that. You just have to read it, maybe slow down your reading a little bit and notice the pieces that give you some indication of what's going on. These historians thought something and then about the plows and then the pollen shows that something different is happening. All right. So um, let's keep going with this. So let's look at this. Go ahead and read this one. So again, a lot of details here. What's the most useful part? What are, what are the most useful parts of this, right? Okay, so right in the beginning, another example. So, so far we've been talking about this pollen and how this pollen is helping to us get a better understanding of what's going on and these changes in the Irish landscape since, you know, better understanding since these historical documents aren't entirely helpful. Um, and then they get into, again, a lot of details here, right? Flax cultivation, uh, linen producing areas. I mean, do you know what linen is? Do you know exactly what linen is? I mean, I have an idea. I think it has something to do with like bed sheets or something. Um, the better understanding you have, the better, but, you know, go with what you got. Go with what you do understand. Um, Documentary record tells little. You know, again, this is circling back to what we were talking about earlier in that first paragraph. Problems with the documentary record. And then we get this other, uh, you know, again, later, later down here. Some historians led some historians to believe, to surmise that the plant was being cultivated in down. Okay, so again, historians are believing something here. So, you know, often just if you're having trouble with a paragraph, notice that they mention somebody. Notice, you know, focus more on the people being mentioned, the players, the characters, and what's going on with them. What are they doing? So the historians surmise they believed something, that the plant was being cultivated in down before the 18th century. But, however, transition, right, something new is going to happen. Pollen analyses indicate that this was not the case that the pollen was found only in deposits laid down since the 18th century, okay? So again, there might be a lot of details in here that are just, you know, making your head spin a little bit. I mean, a lot of people would look at this passage and, and just not 
you know, I don't know about flax and pollen and linen and all this stuff. But again, you know, it, it's, it, it's enough to understand that the historians are, are, are surmising something, they're saying something about this plant being cultivated before the 18th century. But the pollen, again, this, this pollen seems to be the hero of this, of this show, right? The pollen's the hero of this show. Indicate that this isn't the case. The pollen indicates that something else is happening that the plant was not being cultivated before the 18th century, only at the 18th century or later. All right, so let's just read this final paragraph in this passage. So what's important in here, it, the first sentence, really, the first part of the first sentence, um, it must be stressed that there are limits to the ability of the pollen record. And, and again, if you got that, if you got an idea from just that, oh, there are limits to the ability. So there's some kind of limit. They're just talking about all these great things we're learning from pollen. And then we say there are limits to the pollen, to the ability of the pollen, to reflect the history of the landscape. Right. And then, you know, for example, okay, great. So now we're going to get an example of that. So if you just understand this first sentence, then, and the rest of this kind of starts, you know, making your eyes roll back and it's just like matter. What are they talking about? You know, genus or family of some plants. I'm not really sure what that's all about. I remember something about that from high school, but I'm not really sure. Like, again, your understanding of this may depend a lot on just on your background and interests. You're understanding the details. You're understanding the passage shouldn't. Your understanding of the passage should, base, should, should depend on your ability to identify the lines, the sentences that are giving you a main point, the things that you do understand, right? The things that you can understand. And a lot of this, what a lot of this comes down to is noticing kind of these main ideas, but also noticing relationships and noticing how different paragraphs are related to one another. So this is what we call a passage map. And this is something that it can, it can play out in a couple of ways. This can be just a mental process, right? This could be something that as you're reading, you just have this idea, this kind of mental index in your head of each paragraph and what each paragraph is about. The main idea of each paragraph, right? Historical documents, paragraph one, provide a fragmentary record of the changing Irish landscape. Paragraph two, we're talking about these po fossilized pollen grains, provide an additional means of investigating Pollen evidence in this county, this place, shows that soils were tilled before the introduction of the plow, which contradicts the historians. And then flax pollen was found only in deposits from the 18th century or later. Again, contradicts what some historians are saying. Last paragraph, there are limits to using the pollen. So if you just get this general idea of what each paragraph is about, and again, it, it, so if you did understand this, if you had a really good idea, if, you, if, you had, if you're reading each of these paragraphs and just nodding your head and going, yeah, I understood that, that's not too confusing, then fantastic, but you still would want to have this kind of a mental index in your head. You still would want to have this understanding of each paragraph in the passage, the main point, the main idea, and how they're related to one another. Because if you understand, you know, the main idea of each paragraph and you have a sense, uh, get a sense of how they're related, like this is kind of introducing a problem with these historical documents. And that's leading us into this second paragraph, which provides a solution, right? It's saying, hey, we can use these pollen grains to provide some additional means of investigating, understanding. And then the rest of these, the, or the next two at least, the next two paragraphs are giving examples of that, examples of how we use the pollen, supporting the uh, opinion, this idea from the author that, you know, we can use these, these pollen grains to provide, a, a, you know, an additional understanding. And then we get this little caveat here, right? This, li this little uh, kind of a, a not really like totally blowing the whole idea of using these grains out of the water, but saying, just saying, hey, there's a limit, right? A little bit of a, of a pullback. 
this, the, using this pollen is great, but, but not perfect, not perfect. And this is a very common pattern on the LSAT, right? We introduce a problem, we talk about a solution, we give some examples of how the solution works, and then we go, but, you know, there's still, you know, some research that still needs to be done, or our understanding isn't perfect, isn't complete. But one thing to notice is that really all of these paragraphs are pointing towards this second paragraph. So if you have an idea of how each paragraph, you know, what like the main ideas of each paragraph, and you're starting to see how they're related, how they connect to one another, you'll very often notice that all the paragraphs tend to funnel and point in towards one of these paragraphs. And that's what can give you an understanding of the main idea of the passage as a whole. And if you get that, if you notice that all these are, are kind of funneling in and, and zeroing in and focusing on that second paragraph, then um, that's what leads us into this idea of the main point or the scale. So main point of the, par the, the passage as a whole. One of these, if you understand the main point of each paragraph, one of those main points of a paragraph is going to be the main point of the passage as a whole. Um, generally, generally, it might be like a, a, a balance between the two, like, oh, there's a problem with the historical documents, or, uh, and then now there's a, a solution, we're using these pollen grains. That's why we use this idea of a scale, right? Kind of two sides, or you can even think of it as two buckets, two different buckets that you're putting information in. And very often, LSAT passages are going to be structured in a way where they're giving you kind of two sides. The most common way to do it is they're giving you a debate, one side versus the other. And especially often like the author of the passage is gonna be disputing the critics. So they introduce some idea and then the critics come and say something about it, right? The critics, you know, criticize whatever this idea is or this person. And then the author is actually gonna dispute what those critics say, but it doesn't have to be a debate. Um, sometimes this two-sided structure is like what we just saw in this, uh, um, um, in this passage, which is an old way versus new way, or even more specifically, a problem versus a solution. So old way versus new way might be like, you know, hey, we used to rely on these historical documents, but now we're using pollen. Or just more specifically, like this one was describing, we didn't, you know, we don't know actually when we started using the pollen. We don't know when scientists started using the pollen. But certainly there was a problem with, with understanding the history of this, you know, landscape. And then the pollen provided a solution. Um, you might get a passage that's more intended to show how something is unique, right? To highlight a distinction. Very often the humanities passages will, will, be, will be structured like this. It might be talking about a specific author or a specific artist or a specific novel or a specific piece of work and talking about how that is distinct. Um, or they might, sometimes these scientific passages are talking about a certain idea, a thesis, or a theory, like a scientific theory. And what they're doing is uh, explaining it. So you get the idea of the theory right in the very beginning, and then they're explaining, the rest of the paragraphs are explaining, you know, how that theory works. So there isn't always a two-sided structure to these passages, but very often there is. You should always be looking for it. You always want to notice it if it's there, but also be prepared for the, for the, the you know, passages that don't really fall into two different sides or two different categories. And definitely keep in mind that there isn't always going to be a, de a debate. Like nobody in that last passage was saying, hey, the problem's great. No, those old documents that are not giving us all the information we need. No, they're fantastic. And this pollen stuff, you know, like nobody's arguing against the idea that the pollen is useful. The author does say at the end that there's a you know, limit to the solution, but it's not always a debate. It's not always an argument. Notice if it is, if it is but what we're talking about when we talk about the scale is just anytime there's a two-sided structure to the passage. Um, kind of two buckets that you can you can put things in. So very often the uh, the if you understand the main point of each paragraph and you can distill that down into seeing or identifying the main point of the passage as a whole, then you know that you can understand that through the lens of of, of a scale, two different sides. We use this like law lawyer law scale as a as a little bit of imagery. And you always want to notice if the author is trying to convince you of something, if the author has a point. And the author's point here pretty, pretty much seems to be that these fossilized pollen grains are giving us more information that these historical documents don't. Everything in this passage seems funneled into demonstrating that that's the case, although there are some limits.
So this is all great, and this is all what you should be looking for as you read. And again, you want to adjust your reading strategy to, to let you get this kind of an understanding of the passage. And that may mean that you just, you know, pause at the end of each paragraph and take a moment to reflect on what you just read, maybe skim back really quick and, and you know, let your eyes glance back at the past paragraph really quickly and notice, oh yeah, that one, you know, uh, line in the middle or that very first sentence, that's what this whole paragraph is about. But creating this mental map of the passage, identifying each paragraph and, and you know, what, what each paragraph is about. Um, if you need to slow down a little bit, though, to, to get a better idea of what the main points are in each paragraph, then do that. With practice, you'll learn to do it, you know, maybe more quickly, more efficiently by test day. But you, you, need, to, you need to practice doing this because just reading fast and not getting anything out of the passage and then stumbling through the questions isn't going to help you that much. Develop the skills to, to develop this kind of this passage map and understand the main point of the passage. Understand if there are kind of two sides contradicting one another or, you know, an old way versus a new way problem versus a solution. Identify that and then uh, work on, you know, being able to identify it a little more quickly. So the whole point of this is to allow you to answer the questions. So we're going to look at a couple questions from this passage right now and show you how this way of reading becomes very, very useful to you when it's time to answer the questions. So when you go to answer a question, another really useful technique that people often overlook is something we call prephrasing. When you're getting ready to read a question, and we've kind of been conditioned all our lives, right? That you read, you know, you're taking a test, you read the question, and you immediately dive in and look for the correct answer. The LSAT rewards a few seconds of thought. The LSAT rewards people who are gonna pause and think for a second before they do something or say something. Um, so when it comes to answering reading comprehension questions, you read the question, which of the following most accurately expresses the main point of the passage? Pause for a second before you look at the answer choices and, and think. You know, I often describe this as like a word association game. You know, maybe you played this before. It's like, you know, if I say um, baseball, what do you think of? If I say chocolate, what do you think of? If I say ice cream, what do you think of, right? So the first thing that pops into your head, it's the same thing when you read a reading comp question stem like this, pause for a second. What's the first thing that pops into your head? If it's pollen, that's great. You know, pollen versus documents or pollen filling in gaps left by old documents, like whatever few words or phrases pop into your head can, you know, can be very useful. You don't have to spend a lot of time thinking, but certainly just spending a couple seconds, pausing for a couple seconds and letting something pop into your head. Because maybe you have based on, and, and this is a, this is the main point questions. They're really, they're, they're very often the first question that comes after the passage. They're very common question type in reading comprehension. And they're, they're like the poster child for the type of understanding that I was just talking about when you read the passage. Getting this, you know, main point of each paragraph and then seeing how they kind of all funnel into a main point of the passage as a whole. This is directly testing your understanding of that, of getting that information as you read. Not, do you remember when plows first came to Ireland? Or not, do you remember, they're not testing, you know, this, this type of question. And many of the questions on the LSAT are not testing your understanding of specific details. Your ability to answer is going to be based on getting the big picture understanding. And if you, you know, underlined every date in there, and every single like scientific term in that passage, like you might do if this was a science test, you could get really bogged down in those details and not see the bigger picture that's going to help you answer a question like this. So um, I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to use my big picture understanding of this to answer this question. And let's go ahead and if you would um, open that chat window. Again, you might need to click chat. Uh, at the bottom of your screen. You might need to hover your mouse over the bottom of the screen. And I want you to, in the chat window, um, tell me what you think the correct answer is. Go ahead and give me an answer in the chat window. What do you think is the correct answer to this question?
All right. So let's talk about this. Um, as we look through now, so once we've taken a moment to prephrase, once we've taken a moment to think about what this question is asking and seeing if our understanding of the passage is going to help us, you know, what do we know in terms of the big picture that can help us answer the question? I'm going to look at each answer choice, and answer choice A sounds pretty good to me, right? We're analyzing fossilized pollen. That seems to be what this whole passage is about. Is useful. Yeah, they seem to be saying it was useful. Uh, supplementing, in some cases, correcting other sources of information, the documents they were talking about in the first paragraph regarding change in the Irish landscape. That all sounds pretty good. Um, B might sound pretty good too. Um, analysis of historical documents together with pollen evidence have led to the revision of some previously accepted hypotheses regarding changes in the Irish landscape. So I'm just gonna focus on those first two. Um, Tom, you're, you, you seem to like answer choice A. Can you say in the chat window any, um, any specific reasons? Can you give me a couple reasons why answer choice B wasn't appealing to you? Because they seem really similar to me. And I'm wondering what, lean, what made you lean more towards A than B. And while you're doing that, if you want to just you know, type a couple notes in the, about that in the chat window, um, talk about answer choice C. Analysis of fossilized pollen has proven to be a valuable tool in the identification of ancient plant species. So I might remember that he really didn't seem to talk much about identification of ancient plant species. Like, I don't remember that being really the main point. And it was more about, you know, contradicting these, these uh, you know, accepted ideas of these historians and correcting our understanding. So it wasn't necessarily just identifying plant species. And very often it's just gonna be like one, one phrase like that that causes us to say no. You know, I don't think answer choice C is right. Notice that answer choice D is about one specific paragraph, right? Analysis of fossilized pollen has, okay, that sounds good. Provided new evidence, yep, that all sounds good. That the cultivation of such crops as cereal grains, flax, and matter had a significant impact on the landscape of Ireland. Well, I don't really know if it's provided new evidence that they had a significant impact. I think we already knew that they had an impact it's just more specific evidence of when things happen, right? That was what that was all about. So D isn't looking good. While pollen evidence can sometimes supplement other sources of historical information, its applicability is severely limited. So notice what they're doing here is they're trying to play off your, your uh, memory of that last paragraph. So the author isn't trying to focus on the idea that there, the pollen evidence is limited. And the author it never actually says that it's severely limited. The author just kind of adds that as, a, as, a, as an end note, that there are limitations, right? There are some limitations. So E is out. So getting down to A and B, A was more general, supplementing. Hmm. So the fact that A is a little more general, useful means of supplementing and in some cases correcting. So yeah, I like, and, and that was a little bit more what it was about, right? It wasn't always about correcting or contradicting, but a way of adding more information. I think they specifically talk about supplementing and in some cases correcting, in some cases correcting. Sometimes, yeah, they're, they're changing what other sources of information led us to believe. Um, and notice that the focus here is on analysis of the pollen which seemed to be really what the whole, the whole passage was about, right? Whereas this is talking about analyses of the historical documents together with the pollen evidence. So yeah, I mean, we kind of have learned something about both, but this passage was more about using the pollen, using the pollen evidence. So because, so a couple of reasons, because A, and, and that I think would be probably the strongest evidence or the strongest reason why I would pick A is because it focuses more on the pollen, whereas B seems to be, you know, kind of equalizing or given the historical documents together with the pollen evidence kind of equal footing, where the passage is really talking about how the pollen is helping us understand where the documents are leaving gaps. Um, and this is one of the things that, you know, you also want to get used to in reading comprehension is sometimes there are, and very often, and it's in logical reasoning too. Very often you're gonna be you're gonna be facing two pretty appealing answers, right? Two answers that are pretty appealing. Um, 
And you need to be willing to look at which one is, because, you know, again, look at the question. The question is asking which of the following most accurately expresses the main point. So you can't be surprised when they give you two answer choices that are, eh, you know, both kind of seem like they could be correct. And in fact, one of the most useful things you can learn to do, or a very, very useful thing that, that, that you'll, you should learn to do on the LSAT, especially in logical reasoning and reading comprehension, is being able to have a, set, a, a pretty clear idea of what you're going to do when you have to decide between two answer choices. This is one of the most common problems that people run into, right? Is people will say, I get, you know, I get down to two answer choices and people either say, I always pick the wrong one or just like, it's just the general problem. Like I, I get down to two answer choices, and I have trouble picking the right one. So what is your process going to be? How are you going to decide when you're down to two answer choices? Uh, I think one of the best ways to do it is this is, a, again, a time to slow down a little bit. Um, even if I'm going at my full LSAT speed, right? And I've been practicing reading comprehension for a while. I can, you know, answer questions pretty quickly. But I don't always go full speed. Where I go quickly is in eliminating answer choices that I'm sure are wrong, like answer choice D. I'm sure this is wrong. This is not what the main point of the passage was. And I'm, I'm sure D is wrong because this is just talking about, you know, one specific facet. It's not talking about how the pollen's, um, you know, improving our overall understanding. So I can go pretty quickly sometimes in eliminating incorrect answers. Where I'll slow down is when I'm looking at two answer choices that both look appealing and reading them each a little more slowly. And thinking about, you know, so that might be my first step. One is just read them a little more slowly. Second step might be, you know, and if that doesn't help, my second step might be go back to the passage. There might be something in one of these answer choices that I can verify, right, that I can go back and look at and verify and, and, and under, you know, and, and see either, yeah, that is right or that's wrong. The last thing I might do, which is maybe what I might need to do to answer this question correctly, is compare the two answer choices and see, like, look for a difference. What's the most significant difference that I see in the two answer choices? And in this case, it might be that the one is just focusing really on the analysis of the pollen, whereas the other one is focusing on both the pollen, you know, the focusing on the pollen being useful, whereas this seems to be focusing on the combination of documents in the pollen. Um, so if you always think about this, like what are, what are the steps that I'm going to follow? If I'm down to two answer choices, what are the steps that I'm going to follow to make a decision between them? And then practice that and really ingrain that process into your head. Try to have your you know, some two or three step process that you're going to, that you're going to follow in that situation. Um, it'll do two things. It'll, it'll very often it'll lead you to the right answer or at least a really good guess, right? Even if you're not 100% certain. Um, Going with the answer choice that you think is best, but after a little bit more careful read, read, very often will give you the right answer. And the other thing it's going to do is, is avoid, you know, help you keep from wasting too much time, which is a big problem that people have on the LSAT, right? It's, it's bad enough if you get down to two answer choices and you pick the wrong one. But it's even worse if you get down to two answer choices and then you spend another minute a whole other minute or minute and a half or two minutes trying to figure out the difference between these answer choices and then still pick the wrong one. And in fact, at that point, if you've spent, you know, uh, another entire minute trying to decide between these two answer choices, even if you pick the right one, you have to think, is that, you know, that's a minute I could have spent on a whole other question. So realizing when it's time to move on in, in, in a question, um, this is, you know, People very often, one of the other than saying that you know they have trouble, they get down to two answer choices, have trouble choosing between them. The other problem that people struggle with on the LSAT is timing. So, looking for opportunities like this where you're going to specifically limit your time and figure out ways to, to prevent yourself from spending more time than you really want to on any specific part of the task, any specific part of the process, whether it's uh you know, answering a single question or, or just deciding, you know, between two remaining answer choices, two appealing answer choices. So um, one last thing I'm going to leave you with is another process you should be clear, clear about is your process for review. 
So not just, you know, doing some work, not just, you know, working on a passage like this, answering questions and seeing how many you get right, but what's your process going to be for reviewing a passage after you've worked on it? So you want to go back and reread the passage, right? And evaluate your reading strategy. Was this an easy passage for me? Did I find it relatively easy to understand? Or was it a difficult passage? And did I react to that correctly? Did I slow down when I needed to? Did I take things piece by piece? Did I spend, you know, the entire time rereading just one paragraph trying to, to understand all these difficult details? Or was I willing to slow down, read, get as much information as I could, focus on the things that I understand, look for the main points, and then move on from that, that paragraph and move on to the next one? Um, sometimes it helps to examine a passage in different ways. Maybe, um, you know, look for, try to identify just what you think is the main point of each paragraph. And then go back and look for the players. Like, who are the people that were mentioned? Were any people mentioned in this passage? And what were they saying about them? What was being said about them? Or what were they saying? Um, go back and look for those transition words, like however, or for example. Go and look for those words or phrases that can give you a good idea of how one sentence relates to another. So you could go back and read any paragraph in a reading comp passage or the entire passage itself two or three times in two or three different ways, looking for different things each time. And it's just approaching it from different angles and building your ability and your toolbox and your ability to look at a, a paragraph and use these different tools, these different ways of understanding it based on, you know, what's, what's how well you understand the content or not. When you review the questions, uh, make sure you're taking time to think about the question that you read as you read it and prephrase that question. And, um, um, you know, did you take a moment to think about what they were asking you? If they talk about a specific line in the passage, should you just go back and, and look at that line again? Or do you remember that well enough to, to, to evaluate the answer choices? Um, think about why wrong answers are wrong and think about what makes the correct answer correct. What makes the correct answer the best answer or the correct answer to that question? And then evaluate your timing. Think about how long you're spending on these questions and think about whether or not you... Um, there are things that you could be doing. Where are you spending the most time? Try to notice where you're spending the most time. Notice if you're spending, you know, you're, you're spending 30 seconds, you know, you're reading the question, going right to the answer choices, eliminating a few answer choices, and then you're spending like another minute deciding between two. And is that time that would be better spent on something else? All right, folks, um, I'm going to go ahead and leave it there. A couple last things. Uh, if you're interested, we do have, and I'll put this in the chat window. We do have some good free resources if you're interested on our website. Um, and I'll go ahead and put this up in the chat window. Um, some free resources. And uh, also, if you are interested, um, you can attend session one of any of our online classes for free, any of our in-person or online classes for free. So there should be a link there. And if you're watching this, uh, the recording of this, um, there should be a link in the comments uh, to this information where you can go find a list of our classes or you can go find, uh, uh, and, and like I said, you can sit down on session one, the first session of any course for free. You do have to register, you do have to sign up, but uh, you can sit on session one for free and see what our classes are all about. We go into a lot more detail in the classes, obviously, than we can in just you know one hour here in these free prep hours. Um, but also, again, a lot of free resources, a lot of really useful free resources. So I would suggest that you go to our website and check out some of those free resources um, and uh, use those. Take advantage of those as you're preparing, as you're, uh, you know, as you're, as you're working through your prep and preparing for the test. Um, but in terms of tonight, this is all I have for you this evening. And uh, Hopefully we'll see you guys back here some uh, next time.